Hi everyone, so as many of you know, I am primarily an Olympus shooter. And I've been shooting Olympus Micro Four Thirds for about four years now, ever since switching over from a Nikon full frame system. And I've been extremely happy with it. I mean, the image quality, the size, the weight, the ergonomics, the lens selection, I mean, everything about it has been a perfect fit for me, both personally and professionally. However, I recently had a chance to uh, try out this Canon RP because uh, my cousin bought this about a year ago and I said hey you know let me borrow that thing let me see what that's like so I thought in this video I'd share with you sort of my impressions of this camera and how it compared against my Olympus system So long story short, this is an excellent camera. I mean, it takes beautiful pictures. It has great video, terrific autofocus. The handling and ergonomics are very good. Um, I really have very little complaint about this camera. I'll get into some shortcomings I think that you should be aware of, but for the most part, if you buy this camera, I think you'll be very, very happy. So first, let me give you my impressions about the camera's body. Uh, first of all, the grip is excellent. You know, when I put my hand here, it's very, very comfortable. As you can see, there's plenty of room between my hand and the lens. I can fit my fingers in here no problem. The shutter button here right on front at an angle. You know, my finger fits, you know, just rests there very naturally for taking pictures. So I would, I would give this grip like an A minus. I would give it an A plus, but I think if you have larger hands, um you need to get an additional grip down here at the bottom they sell one that's about you know this tall that goes on the bottom so that's why i'd give it an a minus now as far as the controls go i think almost everything is in the perfect place because when i put my hand on it if you look at where my thumb goes on the back it doesn't really touch any of these other buttons accidentally I can rest my hand here very comfortably without worrying about accidentally pushing other buttons. I'm like on my Fuji camera, uh, you know, that has that stupid Q button in the corner. But uh, compared to my Olympus cameras, I mean, the EM5 Mark III doesn't have a grip, so I bought an external one. But this is certainly more comfortable than the EM5 Mark III with my uh, third-party grip here that I bought for it. But that being said, uh, this compared to, say, the EM1 Mark II, I think the EM1 Mark II grip is a little more comfortable. Now, as far as the other buttons and controls on it, it does have two dials. You can use this dial here, and then there's a dial here on the top. And I like the rear dial, but I don't like this dial too much because when I rest my hand on here like this, it's, it's a little awkward to move my finger I mean, it's kind of a stretch for my hand. I don't know why, but it's not, it's not natural for me. I'd much prefer like a combination dial and button like I have on my Olympus cameras. But that said, you know, you get used to it, right? And the same thing goes for like the record button. It's a little bit too far away, so you're not gonna accidentally push it, but I, I still prefer my Olympus uh, buttons and dials, to be honest. But overall, you know, again, I'd give it like an A minus overall for where all the buttons and dials go. It has just enough, but not too many buttons and dials on it. So you're not cluttering the back or accidentally pushing things. Now, when we look at the bottom of the camera, we have the tripod socket here nicely centered into the middle of the body. So we have good rigidity, even for uh, larger lenses like this. I wouldn't use anything larger, but uh, this is a good place for the tripod socket. However, what's more interesting to me is actually the battery compartment. Now, when we open the battery compartment, the door itself is fairly well made and it's spring loaded. However, uh, when you open the battery door, the camera power shuts off. So I'm not sure if you can buy one of those dummy batteries to put in here where you can have an external power source to run the camera indefinitely. Uh, I can't answer that question, but just so you know, the, when you open the battery door, the camera shuts off. But what I really like about the battery compartment is actually the memory card slot because we have a memory card slot in here but what they did and this is not like any other camera that i have there might be some other brand that has this but you'll notice that the memory card is slightly raised up uh, away from the battery so it's very easy to click in and out and take the memory card out 
I swear, sometimes my other cameras, I feel like I need a pair of tweezers to get the, the memory card out when it's in the battery door like this, but they did a really good job designing this. It's not flush with the battery. Uh, it sticks out. So very good, Canon. Now looking at the back of the camera, we have our normal buttons here, but I like how they separated the AF button, the AF on so for back button focusing, and the auto exposure lock button are separate. And then just below that is the focusing button, which will toggle the uh, touch screen to be touch to focus or touch to take a picture. Uh, it probably has some other settings too, but that's what I used it for. And then finally, a, you know, a fully articulating screen, which is fine. And of course you can close it, you know, when you're packing away, it'll protect the screen if you fold it in this way. Now the EVF here is normal. It's just your 2.3 million dot OLED display. It's very clear. Uh, and also there's decent eye relief here, but you can also adjust the screen inside the EVF to be a little bit smaller so that if you do have to take the uh, camera a little bit further away from your eye, because maybe you're wearing glasses or something, uh, you'll still be able to see the entire uh, image. Now on the top of the camera, there's a couple of interesting things here. We have a little lock switch here. Because this dial here, when you rotate it, might change aperture or shutter speed or whatever it's set to. And then you can lock it so that now when you rotate this dial, the settings are locked and they won't change. So that's kind of an interesting feature. And then also you have three custom settings here right on the mode dial. And what that allows you to do is save like three different kinds of settings for the type of photography you might be uh, doing. So you might have one set saved for like landscapes and you might have another group of settings that you want to save for birds in flight or sports action. And then you might have different settings say for like macro photography and you can quickly change between these settings after you save them to each of the individual custom mode dials. So this is a nice feature to have on an entry level camera like this. So overall, I think the body is really well made. It's comfortable to hold, feels sturdy. The buttons are well laid out and there's some nice attention to detail like the little lock switch and the memory card that I talked about. Uh, so I, I have no complaints about the camera's body. I, I give it a an A. Now looking at the live view on the back of the display or through the EVF, it's pretty standard. It gives you all of the information you need to know and you can kind of toggle through these for different types of information. Uh, and there's some customizability to that in the menu, so that's pretty standard. But what I really like is like on the mode dial, when I rotate the mode dial, you'll notice that at the top you kind of get a ticker tape of what's next as you're rotating the mode dial. So you don't have to look back at the mode dial to see what's next. You can, you can just be looking at the EVF or the live view to see what's next through the ticker tape. Uh, and that's really very handy for people with bad eyes like mine. And I can't, you know, all of this is blurry to me. <laughs> so I really like that part. And then of course there's some uh, additional settings uh, that are good for beginners, but generally I just click OK and go to the live view and start taking pictures. So let's just briefly talk about the menu system. Uh, you access it through the uh, top left button here. And actually I prefer this button on the right side so I have all one-handed operation, but um, a lot of companies are doing it this way now. I don't know why. Anyway, the menu system is not bad and you can scroll through it either with the front top dials here or you can use the D-pad or if you have the uh, screen on, you can just uh, access it through the touch screen, all the different things very quickly. And there's a very good selection of settings here, so you can customize the camera to some extent or tweak some of the settings. Uh, it's fairly comprehensive. There's a couple of things missing that I'll talk about when I start comparing it with the Olympus camera. But uh, overall, uh, fairly comprehensive uh, feature set in the menu. For an entry-level camera, it has a fairly comprehensive set of features in the menu. Uh, like I've already mentioned, you know, you can uh, do custom settings, save them in the mode dial. You can customize the buttons. It has a built-in intervalometer. It has bracketing and HDR. So I think even for a beginning photographer, you'll be able to grow with this camera as your skill set grows for a long time. Uh, but there are a couple of misses. The uh, silent shutter is probably the biggest one. Basically, you can only access the silent shutter through scene mode on the mode dial. And then once you activate the silent shutter, the camera goes into auto mode and it automatically does the exposure for you. So you have no control over the exposure if you're using silent shutter. 
So you're not going to be able to use it in manual mode or aperture priority mode or shutter priority. Uh, it's just not available to you. The camera's only going to let you use silent shutter in full auto. Uh, so if you don't care about silent shutter, okay, you'll be fine. The other thing is the uh, continuous autofocus uh, shutter speed. It's like four frames per second. I mean, it's, uh, wow. That feels like molasses now compared to almost any other modern camera today. So uh, I wouldn't call it a sports action camera. I mean, you'll be able to get some shots maybe, but yeah, just be prepared for that. Although I hear the buffer is pretty good. I didn't test that because I didn't want to run up the shutter count on my cousin's camera, but uh, I think most people have said that the buffer is pretty good. But honestly, if you're shooting four frames per second, I think just about any buffer is going to be feel good at that point, right? Or, or look good. Uh, the other thing is... And this is not a big deal either, but the 4K video has like this humongous crop in it. And then if you apply any kind of image stabilization, the, the digital image stabilization, it crops it even more. So you can do 4K video if you get a really wide lens. So you got to spend some bucks on that. Uh, but then you still have the problem with the uh, autofocus because you lose the famous dual pixel autofocus that Canon's known for, and it goes to contrast detect, which is okay. But yeah, I would say I wouldn't buy this camera for 4K. It definitely, I would just say 4K does not exist on this camera to me. It's dead to me. Uh, but the 1080p is excellent. It has some great auto exposure modes uh, that I think work well. And uh, the colors and everything look really good. And it has also has a very interesting HDR feature in video mode. I didn't like it too much, uh, but you can try it. You might like it. It's okay. And also, the, you know, with the new firmware update, they also added the uh, 24p for 1080. So that's a good thing too. Okay, so let's just do a quick vlogging test. I have the uh, Canon RP here with the 24 to 240, and I'm going to be leaving the little uh, image stabilization switch here on the lens turned on. And then we're going to test against the two stabilization modes in the camera, which are digital. One's called regular, and one's called enhanced. And uh, we're going to compare that against the M5 Mark III with sensor shift only IBIS, which is where the sensor is actually moving around, and then sensor shift plus digital on the Olympus. Uh, and then on the lens, I just have the 12 millimeter F2 here, just to match the focal length of 24 millimeters on the Canon. And I'm gonna be recording both in full HD uh, 24p. So maybe we can test for rolling shutter as well. I, I don't know if that's really that important with video in my opinion, but you know, we can check it. And also um, we'll compare the internal mics on the cameras. And for the most of the video, you're going to be hearing me on the wireless uh, road mic here, but uh, we will do a comparison of just the straight, you know, mics, internal, or internal mics on the cameras. And what I'll do is I'm just going to hold the cameras out at arm's length, kind of like this, and uh, walking around in my lumpy backyard. So it'll be a good test. It's going to be really jerky and bouncing around a lot because this is heavy. <laughs> All right, so I have the Canon RP with the 24 to 240 lens, and I have it all the way wide at 24 millimeters. And I have the Olympus EM5 Mark III with a 12 millimeter f2, and it's a it's a fixed prime. Uh, so this should be roughly the same um, field of view, right, give or take. There may be some parallax error, but I think this is the same field of view, basically. And um, right now, like I said, there's no image stabilization on. So let me just walk around the backyard here, my lumpy backyard. And the grass needs to be cut again. It's just constant. But I just wanted you to get a feel for what no image stabilization at all looks like. All right, now I have the Canon on regular image stabilization and the Olympus on sensor shift only. And as you can see, the Canon has cropped in already quite a bit. Uh, so the field of view is a little bit tighter. Um, but let's walk around. And of course, you know, the image stabilization on the uh, Olympus is going to be better. But I'm curious to see how it compares against the digital image stabilization on the Canon 
which also has lens stabilization. So I forgot to mention that. The lens stabilization was probably on. Let me see. Yeah, lens, lens stabilization was on, whereas the Olympus had no stabilization on at all in the previous test. So let's just walk around a little bit, just so you get a feel. And the lighting's a little bit soft today, it's cloudy, but that's okay. Let me switch arms, man, this is heavy. Digital image stabilization set on the Olympus, along with sensor shift, so MIS-1 which is the best it has. And then I have the Canon set to the best image stabilization it has, which is called the Enhanced. But of course, it does crop in quite a bit, right? Uh, oh, my hand is really wobbling all over, so this should be a really good test of the image stabilization. Let me see if I can hold this a little more stable. Maybe closer to the base. Now oh, that feels a little better. <laughs> a little less torque on my arm or on my wrist. I'm gonna walk into the shade here try and avoid the poison ivy and oak and ticks and mosquitoes. All right, let's just do another quick sound test. Now the ambient noise in my uh, backyard is pretty heavy because of the highways and airports and everything. So I think um, what you're hearing now is the Canon internal microphones with, you know, not using external microphone. I've been using an, uh, my little road, you know, wireless mic up to this point. Now, let's listen to the Olympus without the microphone. Now we're on the Olympus internal microphones versus the Canon microphone. So again, right now I'm using the Olympus microphones and I think I'll just put titles down below for these. All right, now let's do just a rolling shutter test. I have this uh, fence behind me with some poles. So just look at the poles, they're relatively straight. And this is with image stabilization on. And I'm just gonna pan, like so. And then let's focus on this one pole here in the center. Let me see, yeah, all right. So now I'm just, if I was turning quickly, say I want to look at this tree over here, and then I want to pan over here to this tree, and then look up. Okay. Now let's talk about the image quality, and it's, it's excellent. I mean, the images coming out of it are beautiful, and the Canon Color Science, it's a little warm for my taste, but uh, I can see where a lot of people really like it. It's very, very good with skin tones and things like that. Um, nothing that can't be easily duplicated, you know, in any other camera by shifting the white balance slightly or tweaking it. But for the most part, the straight out of camera images are very pleasing. And as for the lens, the 24 to 240 is very sharp lens for what it is. Uh, it'll never be as sharp as a prime lens, for example, but uh, you know, I tested it compared against my Olympus 14 to 150 kit lens, and wide open, the 24 to 240 is sharper. Uh, definitely, it's a little bit sharper. Now, in wide angle shots, you don't need that much sharpness unless you're going to crop all the way in. But if you take a wide angle picture, your intent is not to crop it, right? Uh, so I'd say. In a blind test, it'd be hard to tell, but when you start pixel peeping, yeah, you'll, you'll see that the lens does perform very well wide open against the Olympus 14 to 150. And uh, then when you zoom all the way in, I'd say that's where the Canon either is equal to the Olympus lens or maybe a tad better. But for the most part, at that point, I would say it was equal, even when I'm pixel peeping. Now, the only weird thing I noticed about the Canon lens, the 24 to 240 in particular, is when I zoomed all the way out to 240 millimeters, the bokeh got very weird. It started getting like these streaks in it. It almost looks like a oil painting or something. I mean, not, not in a pleasant way, but in a very distracting way. So uh, I'll show you what I mean here. So yeah, it didn't happen every single time, but time to time, more often than not, that's what I saw. 
And that's the only thing I didn't like about it when I zoomed all the way out. Now, as I started to back off, the bulk is very pleasing, very soft, very smooth. I mean, it has it has very smooth bokeh, so I, I think it's very good until you zoom all the way out to 240. Now let's talk about the autofocusing system. Compared to the EM5 Mark III, the Canon was definitely superior. Now, if we're just going to be doing point and shoot, you know, take a picture here, take a picture there, they're the same. Even in low light, the Canon kept up pretty well with the M5 Mark III, though I'd give the M5 Mark III a little bit of an edge on the low light autofocusing. However, where the Canon really shined was in the face detect autofocus. So I did a little test where I stood in front of the camera, took a picture, walked back, you know, half a meter, a meter, took another picture, and then did that 10 times walking back. And after about three or four meters, the Olympus lost track of my face and just started focusing on anything that found contrast. Whereas on the Canon, I got almost 10 meters back and it still was able to lock onto my face. And I ran this test, I'd say three times, maybe four times. And the Canon consistently got all of the shots or maybe missed one. So I'd say better than nine times out of 10. If you're less than 10 meters away, uh, and I was at about 87 millimeters on focal length. Uh, I'd say the Canon, you can trust the Canon to lock onto a person's face and get that focus. Now, the other part of continuous autofocus is tracking. And again, the Canon did a better job here. Uh, I had more keepers on the Canon than I did on the Olympus. And I didn't do a lot of testing with continuous autofocus because, or with tracking, because it's very hard to duplicate testing conditions. I was just taking pictures of my dog running around the yard and the Canon had a few more keepers and the Olympus had barely any. Uh, but the tracking on the Olympus cameras, even when I slowed it down to four frames per second to match the Canon, just lost the subject constantly. Whereas the Canon, actually, it did keep up pretty well. And it didn't acquire focus every time, even though I saw the green dots, you know, bouncing around on my dog. But at least it was trying, and it did get a few more keepers than the Olympus. Now that said, there's no tracking system better than your own eyes, right? So if you want to track a moving subject, the best way to do it is to build up your skills and practice using a single point or five point autofocus and track it yourself in continuous autofocus. And trust me, you'll get much better results that way than relying on any camera intelligence. So to sum it up, I think this is a great camera. I mean, for $14.99, you're getting a full frame Canon system that has good ergonomics, is well built, um, some thoughtful touches here and there, especially I love the SD card slot. Uh, together with this 24 to 240 lens that has a you know terrific zoom range 10x and uh, is very sharp for what it is. However, we need to talk about the elephant in the room here, right? And that's the size and weight of the overall system and the selection of lenses. Now you can mount all the old Canon L mount or F mount, whatever they call it. You know the older Canon autofocus lenses with the adapter. But that's not ideal. That you kind of lose the point of having a mirrorless system because you're adding this thick adapter to the front of the camera. Also, the choices that they have right now are just, wow, they're so expensive, right? I mean, who's gonna spend $2,000 for a lens? I mean, you might, but this is an entry-level camera, right? You spend $1,499, you're probably thinking, man, that's a that's a lot of money to start with just for a camera. And then when you start looking at the lenses that go with this, it's crazy. Now they do have what looks like a beautiful 35 millimeter F1.8. It's, you know, probably half the size of this lens and will give you excellent image quality. And I think for 500 bucks, that's a good deal. And it's probably a better fit for this camera. Also the 24 to 105, they're practically giving away when you buy it as a kit with this camera. I think that's an also an excellent choice. And surely down the road, there's going to be more affordable choices. So where does that leave the EM5 Mark III with respect to the Canon RP? Which camera should you get, given they're about the same price? Well, really, that's a very personal decision. And for me, I will pick the EM5 Mark III every single time. I don't even have to think twice about it, because I know what this camera can do.
That said, yeah, full frame sensor is gonna beat a micro four thirds in any measurable way every time. There might be an exception in one of the tests, like I think at base ISO, this had a little better uh, ISO invariance at pulling shadows and highlights and things like that. But as we creeped up the ISO scale, the Canon did a better job. And that's gonna be true at any higher ISO for any full frame camera over a micro four thirds. Also, this camera has some other significant features in it, like the in-body image stabilization. It's one of the best in the industry. The Canon RP uses digital, uh, other than what might be in the lens or not. Also, this camera has a much faster shutter speed. I mean, the mechanical is up to 1 8,000th of a second, whereas the Canon's limited at 1 4,000th. This also has true silent shutter up to 1 32,000th of a second. This also has a faster continuous shutter mode uh, where this will do in pro capture, it'll capture like 30 frames uh, per second prior to pressing the shutter button or capturing the image, which makes shots like this butterfly and this bee effortless. On a Canon with four frames per second, you're gonna have to up your uh, photography skill set to get an image like that. Uh, but on the Olympus, that was a piece of cake. Uh, this also has a much richer and deeper feature set in the menus. For example, and I can't go through all of them, but for example, the uh, bracketing menu. The Canon, you know, they both do exposure bracketing, focus bracketing, uh, HDR, but the Olympus, in addition to exposure bracketing, it'll also do ISO bracketing, it'll do flash bracketing. The focus bracketing menu is much more comprehensive. In addition to that, it has focus stacking, where it'll bracket the focusing and then stack them together for you in camera, so you don't need to do it in software later. Um, the intervalometer, they both have that, but the intervalometer in the uh, Olympus is much more sophisticated. It'll also compress the images and make a movie for you right in camera uh, from those uh, images that are taken in using the intervalometer. And I could go on and on about all of the features, but suffice to say, as a photographer's tool, the M5 Mark III is a much more powerful camera in that respect. Buying a camera is really a very personal decision, and I've shared with you why I prefer the EM5 Mark III over the Canon RP. But you may have seen all of this and much prefer the Canon RP. And if that's good with you, it's good with me, because really all I care about is you go out, have some fun, take some pictures, you know, save those memories so you can share them with your family. Uh, that's all that really matters. So thanks again for watching. Hopefully you like this video. And if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments below. But either way, hopefully we'll see you again soon.